They confuse human value with human function. So what they do is they say, like racists, our victim class might be humans, but they're not persons. So what happens when being human is not enough to have natural rights, brothers and sisters? Because what's the only thing we have in common? A human nature, right? Look around the room. Do we have gender, age, size, development, IQ, athleticism, musical ability? Do we have any of these things in common? No, the only thing we have in common is a human nature. So what happens when being human is not enough to ground your rights? Well, then the high priests of secular progressivism and the elite class, the political class, they get to determine the litmus test for personhood. In 1850, that litmus test was IQ and skin color. Those were the number one arguments of racists. The Democratic Party said that blacks had the wrong skin color and they were stupider. Those were their primary arguments. For Nazis, it was religion and appearance. And with unborn children, it's size, level of development, environment and dependency. They're smaller, they're less developed, they're in a womb, and they're more dependent. Those are the differences between the unborn and us. But they even go further than that. They begin to come up with cognitive abilities or functions that they say you must meet in order to be a person. But they don't create these categories just accidentally. They create them with the foreknowledge and express intention of justifying the mistreatment of the unborn. Here's what I mean by this. Do you think racists actually believed that it was skin color that was decisive in human value? They didn't actually believe that. Because skin color comes in varying degrees, right? So even if all of the white racists in the Democratic Party held their palms up to one another in Congress, would they all have the same shade of skin color? No, it comes in varying degrees. But if you grant the racist argument that melanin is decisive in human value, then it would follow that the palest of skins has the greatest rights and the darkest of skins has the least rights. So albinos would rule over all of the normal pale-skinned white racist Democrats in that party. But not even they actually believed that, did they? So they didn't actually believe that skin color was part of the litmus test for personhood. So what did they believe? They already wanted to discriminate and dehumanize blacks, and so they came up with arbitrary standards and checkboxes or functions that they said one must meet to be a person. But they did that with the foreknowledge and intention of knowing that blacks wouldn't be able to meet their ridiculous standards of personhood. So pro-lifers do the same thing to the uh, pro-choicers do the same thing to the unborn today. So they say you must be capable of these functions to be a person, and not ironically the unborn does not meet these functions. So they are self-awareness, consciousness, desires, ability to feel pain, and viability. Okay, let's go through them briefly. Oh, you can kill babies because they're not self-aware. Right, that's what they say. The unborn doesn't know that they're being aborted. They're not aware of their own existence, so it's fine. That's my litmus test for personhood. Okay, very well. Did you know the most recent scientific evidence has shown that infants are not self-aware until months after birth? Meaning they're not aware of themselves as a unique individual that's never existed before and will never exist again. So can we kill those infants, pro-choicer? Now, unless you're Peter Singer, you probably say no. So they're, they're rejecting the application of their personhood litmus test this side of the womb. I wonder why they're doing that. Because then they might endanger their own right. And nothing disturbs the high priests of secular progressivism more than that, is that their debauched view of personhood might be turned around and used against them. So they're just creating them with the foreknowledge that they can only be used to discriminate against the unborn, shocker. What about consciousness? Oh, the unborn's not conscious, right? Well, neither are our loved ones when they're in a coma. Can we slit their throat? In fact, what if you're in the waiting room with your family having that hard conversation about whether to remove life support or not, because grandpa's in a coma, and then I sneak into the room and I slit his throat beforehand? I guess I haven't done anything wrong, right? Right, pro-choicer, because he wasn't conscious. In fact, what if you ended up deciding to pull the plug? but I just slit his throat a minute before. The end result was the same. Grandpa died, so therefore it's morally equivalent. Right, pro-choicer? And he goes, uh, I think that's different. Yeah, exactly, because you're rejecting your litmus test for personhood this side of the womb. What about desires? The baby doesn't have any desires. And some more woke philosopher-type pro-choicers, they'll, they'll, go, they'll go a little bit more fine-tuning with their argument. They'll say that it's desires that ground our rights. So what they'll say is, if I don't violate your desires, I haven't violated your rights. Does that make sense? Because you don't know that you're being denied that right because you never desired it. Does that make sense? So they'll say, if we don't violate the unborn's desires, we haven't violated their rights, and they don't have a desire to go on living. Well, what about suicidally depressed individuals who want to kill themselves and also don't have a desire to go on living? 
What about Buddhists who try to reach nirvana? Anyone know what nirvana is? Getting rid of all desires. Now, I don't think it's possible, but let's say they achieve this. I guess we can kill Buddhists who have reached nirvana, because like the child in the womb, they don't have a desire to go on living. And the protracer goes, eh, I don't think so. Exactly. What about ability to feel pain? The baby doesn't know it's being suctioned or having its limbs ripped off its body. Well, actually, the most recent science of neural pain has suggested that the unborn child responds to stimuli as early as seven or eight weeks. And then by 18 weeks, they're fully capable of experiencing pain at the same level of you and I. So when you kill an 18-week unborn child, it is as painful to them as if I ripped your limbs off your body. But let's grant their premise. Let's say it's at eight weeks, or six weeks, I'm sorry. Okay, they can't feel pain, right? Well, then can we kill born people with the condition congenital analgesia? It's a condition in which you cannot feel any pain. And the pro-choicer goes, well, hmm, no, I don't think so. And then viability. We can kill unborn children through abortion because they're not viable. Now, vi viability, if you don't know, is this ridiculous subjective term that refers to when the child can survive outside the womb. Problem is, that changes every few years because we develop medical technology that enables us to make unborn children able to survive outside the womb. <laughs> and the earliest baby to have survived, born, alive, went home healthy, 21 weeks and zero days. So we've almost cut gestation in half, the, the 40 weeks full gestation, 21 weeks. Crazy, wild, we could not do that 10 or 20 years ago. So viability just becomes this totally subjective term that changes, right? So even if you grant that premise, you'd be forced to say that one's natural right to life is conditional upon the brilliance of scientists. Like your actual natural right to life, it changes every few years, dependent on the minds of adults who will or will not develop technology that will make you viable at that stage of development. That's a completely ridiculous uh, definition. But they say the child's not viable because it can't survive outside the womb because it's dependent on mom. So therefore, because they're dependent, it's up to the mother to decide whether to give her support to that child. Okay? Can we kill born people who are dependent on heart pacemakers, kidney machines, insulin, life support, and caretakers? Like the child in the womb, they're dependent on someone or something else without which they cannot continue to live. Who wants to get on board with killing those people? Well, many pro-choicers do. And this is why many people in the abortion industry and the culture of death support doctor-assisted suicide and euthanasia. Because grandma and grandpa, who are too expensive to take care of and are unwanted, are just like the child in the womb, too expensive to take care of and unwanted. Yes, ideas have consequences. And bad ideas have victims. Now, of course, the pro-choicer never explains why these functions are value-giving in the first place. This is an important point. They never explain why the possession of viability, self-awareness, consciousness, desires, they never explain why the possession of those functions grant value in the first place. They just assume that it's those functions. But why those functions? Why not um, the ability to multiply? Why not the ability to play violin? Those are my new litmus test for personhood pro-choice. Oh, you can't play violin? Sorry, fourth trimester abortions, kill you. And of course, they would laugh at me if I said the litmus test for personhood was the ability to multiply, right? They would think that was really stupid. And why would they think it was stupid? Seth, you can't just pick a random function and just then therefore insinuate that it's needed for a right to life. Uh-huh. And neither can you. So they never explain why the possession of those functions are value-giving in the first place. They just assume it. Back to the first mistake. Lastly, if you grant this premise, remember, that they confuse human value with human function, if you grant this premise that you're only valuable based on your functions and utility and what you can provide to others rather than who you are a human being, if you grant that premise, human equality is destroyed. We're not even equal anymore. If you grant that premise, you don't just dehumanize the unborn, you dehumanize all human beings. Why? Because all of those functions that I just told you, that they say the unborn must meet to have a right to life, come in varying degrees. So if you ground rights in things that come in varying degrees, what follows? Rights, therefore, come in varying degrees. This is not the brilliance of me or the pro-life movement. These were the same points that Abraham Lincoln made into the face of the racist slavery movement. Here's what he said. Same exact thing. He made the same point. Here's what he said. You say A is white and B is black. It is color then. The lighter having the right to enslave the darker. Hmm. Take care. By this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with a skin fairer than your own. Oops. And then Lincoln said, oh, but you say it is a question of intellect. 
that he's, he's responding to the racist, right? You say that whites are intellectually the superiors of blacks and therefore have the right to enslave them? Hmm. Take care again, by this rule, you are to be a slave to the first man you meet with an intellect superior to your own. Oops. And then Lincoln says, but you say it is a question of interest. And if you can make it your interest, you have the right to enslave another. Very well. And if he can make it his interest, he has the right to enslave you. So interest, intellect, and skin color come in varying degrees. So it would mean that the albino rules overall, the person with the highest IQ rules overall, and the person with the most interest rules overall. And if you have an IQ or a skin color that's less than that elite class, you're also not a person. So if you don't ground rights in the only thing we have in common, which is a human nature, and when did we get a human nature? When we became human. And when did we become human? The moment of conception. So it's only the pro-life position that can even maintain this idea of human equality because it grounds our rights in the only thing we have in common.